Many climbers experiencing pain at their pulleys may not have a pulley injury at all. There's actually a completely different injury that presents with many of the same symptoms. It's called flexor tenosynovitis, and as the name implies, it involves the finger flexors that run underneath the pulleys. So in this video, we're gonna show you how to figure out which issue you really have and how the treatment differs between them. We'll also use this handy little ultrasound so we can see in real time what flexor tenosynovitis actually looks like. And who knows, maybe you'll find out your pulleys are actually perfectly fine. So what is finger flexor tenosynovitis? You might think it's some sort of irritation of the tendon itself, but it's actually inflammation of the sheath that surrounds it, caused by friction between the sheath and the pulleys when under heavy load. So if I were to flex that finger, you can see how the tendon wants to pull away from the bone. So it's actually the pulley system that keeps it closer. Now, as you see here, as I pull and create that additional tension, it pulls harder on the pulleys, but it is not the flexor tendon that is contacting the pulley, it is the tubing, or in this case, the sheath. So as we are in that flexed or crimped position, the increased friction is happening to the flexor tendon sheath. The FTP and FDS run through this sheath, which can be seen with the ultrasound. Looking at the tendons here, there's a dark ring or halo around it. That halo happens because of fluid surrounding the tendon's sheath. In an uninjured person, that halo is generally less than two millimeters. All right, so this is Seth. So we had an evaluation and we were very highly suspicious of the tenosynovitis. So we're gonna actually use the real-time ultrasound and see if we can get a confirmation. All right, so we already got the right hand up on there, but we're gonna get the, the left hand going here. And so this is the bone, we have the flexor tendon, and then the black space is representative of any kind of fluid accumulation. So you can see on the right, clearly very minimal, like not much fluid accumulation on the outside there, versus the affected side where we have the fluid accumulation, and we'll, we'll be able to measure that out, but we can clearly see a difference from side to side. If we were to look at a pulley injury, we might see some inflammation there as well. But if the injury is severe, the obvious difference will be the increase in bowstringing, where the tendon pulls further away from the bone than it normally would because the pulley is compromised. So if we had expected a pulley injury, we would expect the distance between the bone and the tendon to change. So as Seth flexed his finger, we would have expected to see this tendon rise up more and lower back down through the contraction. But you can see it stays in relatively the same spot. So that would indicate that there is a healthy pulley or an intact pulley system. So that's why we're using the real-time ultrasound right now so we can get an accurate diagnosis and build a perfect treatment plan for Seth. So if you're trying to get the most accurate diagnosis possible, I recommend scheduling an ultrasound with a clinician who understands climbing injuries. Obviously that's not going to be possible for everyone though, so let's keep going. There are a few things you can look for that don't require an ultrasound. Tenosynovitis will sometimes cause pain when you passively extend your fingers, whereas a pulley injury will likely not cause this. Tenosynovitis may cause pain when pulling in the open hand position, whereas this is less likely with pulley injuries. Tenosynovitis does not usually happen suddenly as a traumatic injury. It tends to build up from overuse, whereas pulley injuries can either be traumatic or overuse related. Tenosynovitis can sometimes cause pain in the forearm, where a pulley injury will not. That should allow you to get a pretty good idea of which type of injury you have, but if you want to be super thorough, you should also try and rule out an injury to the tendon itself called flexor tendinopathy. Use this chart to cross-reference all your symptoms and narrow down your diagnosis. If you think you have a pulley or flexor tendon injury, we have in-depth videos on how to treat those, which we'll link in the description. But if you think you have tenosynovitis, here's what you should do. First, you'll want to reduce or eliminate the aggravating factors. To do that, it helps to know what created the issue in the first place. Since we know that it's the friction between the pulleys and the tendon sheath that caused the inflammation, it's easy to deduce the cause. The half crimp and full crimp create much more friction than the open-handed positions, so frequent crimping is an obvious culprit. Campus boarding on smaller rungs can also play a role, or simply subjecting your fingers to excessive repetitive forces on the wall. Tenosynovitis doesn't happen overnight, so the cause is likely something systemic in your climbing or training habits. Reducing whatever you determine to be the most likely culprit is the first step in treatment. This doesn't mean you need to completely stop climbing though. In fact, some research suggests that is not an effective form of treatment. Second, you want to manage your symptoms with one or more of the following techniques. 
You can use coban tape or fingerlings to create gentle compression and help manage swelling. It can even be worn overnight and with daily activities. This isn't a miracle fix, nor is it strictly necessary, but there is some scientific literature to support it as an aid for this injury. You can use climbing tape to cast or immobilize your finger if you find that helps you avoid crimping while climbing. Beyond that usage of tape, however, it's currently unclear whether supportive taping methods like H taping will help with tenosynovitis or exacerbate it. This is where the rehab differs quite a bit from pulley injuries, where supportive taping is generally recommended. With tenosynovitis, supportive taping could help by reducing the friction from bowstringing, or it could make things worse by adding too much external compression and actually increasing friction. I'm waiting to see more evidence before I can make a strong recommendation. Third, you'll want to perform safe loading of the tissue. This generally triggers tissue healing while improving blood flow and circulation. If your injury is severe, avoid loading the tissue until the pain and swelling subsides to a more moderate level, usually within a week or so. Once you can handle day-to-day -day activities with minimal pain, start loading the tissue lightly with low-intensity holds, progress to open-hand farmer hangs, and even some low-intensity climbing if it's well-tolerated. You essentially want to load as much as possible without creating more than a 2 out of 10 on the pain scale. The pain also shouldn't linger more than a few seconds after you complete a set. As things heal and strengthen, you can slowly progress the weight and intensity, usually over a period of several weeks, eventually adding in some crimping if the pain is minimal. Just remember that tenosynovitis happens from repetitive friction, so progressing the load too quickly may not be obvious at first. Take things slow and use the rest of your training time for things that don't tax the fingers too heavily. Many tenosynovitis injuries can be completely resolved in six to eight weeks, though some will take longer depending on the severity and how diligent you are with your rehab. Fourth, if conservative treatment fails for more than six weeks, corticosteroid injections may be warranted. While there is inherently some amount of risk with this, and thus should probably not be the first line of treatment, the risk appears to be quite low. Results after two injections are quite often good. Finally, there are several other treatments you can try for managing your symptoms and promoting healing, though I don't find any of them to be particularly compelling at this time. I'm listing them here so you can try them out for yourself if you like though, as they present little to no risk and could have a positive effect. As the research grows, we may be able to recommend more specific guidelines, but for now the most important aspect to understand with your training is prevention. Monitor your volume and intensity, frequency of climbing, grip styles, etc. If you have experienced this, be sure to share your story in the comments below. Until next time, train, climb, send, avoid flexor tenosynovitis, and repeat.